Welcome, Welcome to Tenkara in Focus. So, what are we on with this week, John? Yeah. Um, well, coming up in this episode, we are going to bring you an interview with Go Ishii. About time, I think, really, is, yeah. is the word there. I mean, I think, you know, everybody's seen Go beetling around, doing all sorts of things. He is this incredible sort of gateway to the knowledge, and, and he does sort of downplay his involvement and things, but basically... The sum total of what we know in the West about Tenkara, probably a solid 95% of it has had something to do with Go. Yeah. You know, his hand's yeah. been in it to actually bring that out to, to share with us. And to be honest, it's massively increased our success and enjoyment on stream. Mm-hmm. Um, he's also been involved with rod development. You know, helped yeah. us a massive amount with that. Um, the Karasu rods, which, uh, you know, it's, it's not just our, don't take our word for it. People in Japan are literally saying the best rod on the planet. And Go played a yeah. huge part in hooking us up with manufacturers, uh, almost interviewing manufacturers for us, you know, do, do sort the of testing, yeah. you know, the technical input, the yeah. feedback, all that kind of thing. And, and of course, we have a vested interest in suggesting, hey, these rods are great. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. Adjuri, you know, Adjuri, who is the most dependable um, magazine article angler, mm. he goes out and he delivers every time. He's never failed mm. to deliver great top angler. quality uh, photos. Picked up the Karasu 360 and said, actually, this is the best 360 on the market. Yeah, bar be- best one ever made. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And, humbled by that, but yeah, yeah and, quite and scary in a way. Go played no small part in making all of that happen and, and continues to help us make those contacts. Yeah. In addition to producing the best rod on the planet with him, <laughs> um, you will have seen him in all of season one of Tenkari in Focus. He's the guy in almost every Japanese interview. He, he's the guy doing the translating, doing the and, and the interpreting. That's I was the just about to say he doesn't only speak um, fantastic English and Japanese; he speaks fishing as well, yeah. which is vital. We've so we've said this many times when we've been discussing producing Tenkara in Focus. There are three languages in Tenkara: there's English, there's Japanese, and there's fishing. And if the guy interpreting doesn't speak all the languages, you're lost. We have tried with translators who speak Japanese and English very well, but they don't fish. Yeah. And, and, and you'd lose so much of the conversation. Totally. And I think just before we throw out to Go's interview to actually give him at least part of his due, um, it is worth saying that uh, he is one of the top, top percentage of all Tinkara anglers. Mm. He's very modest about it, but actually, when you do that, um, you know that analysis of, of who's up there. Yeah. Technically, he's in the the thin top one percent of the yeah. people that can yeah. actually do that sort of technical stuff. So, without further ado, we're going to throw out now and actually listen to go in his own words. Yeah. Okay, so I was born in this town city called Isehara in Kanagawa Prefecture. And if you see it on the map, you can see that it's about 15, 20 minutes away from the mountains where you can find trout, um, and also about 15 minutes away from the ocean. So I was right in the middle between the mountains and the ocean growing up. And um, my father happened to detest fishing. Um, Quite a bit, but he didn't. He just hated it. But he had this buddy, his coworker, who was really into fishing. But he would he would always invite him and the family, which was you know me and my mom and my sister. So um, I think the first time they took me fishing was uh, when I was three. It was down by the docks, you know, you um, sardine fishing, basically, really simple gear, you know, with real. It was more about the barbecuing, I think, just and let the kids out and have fun. Um, and I didn't catch anything. I did, well, they did the fit, you know, catching, and they would let the kids, you know, turn the reel and just leave, you know, maybe take a fish off the hook or whatnot. But um, they didn't think it was too much fun for us. So right afterwards, they took me to this like goldfish pond, and we fished for goldfish there. And I caught, I think, seventy-three, or I still remember a lot of goldfish. And that's when I got into fishing. Like I was just like, wow, this is. Amazing. And uh, so then after that, I started venturing out to different creeks, uh, streams around my house, sometimes down to the bay by myself or with my um, friends around my house. They were a few, year, few years older. They had their own fishing gear. They let me, you know, fish with it. So we caught carp, 
little minnows and creeks, um, sardines, mackerel type things. Um, so I'd done a lot of fishing and then eventually I was able to, you know, make my rig, my own gear, um, tie knots. Um, and I started reading um, books on fishing. So I started Kadu fishing um, when I was eight. You know, my mom would drop me off by the trail um, of uh, the mountainside, you know, and I'd go in by myself with my backpack with onigiri for lunch and just fish all day. And I caught my first trout, I think, on my second outing, you know, fishing for yamame with like egg roll or something. Um, and then I started spending all of my allowances on this KDU magazine called um, KDU Fishing, which no longer exists now, but they had amazing images. And that was my like Bible, you know, I, I bought them every time they came out. Um, and in one of the uh, magazines, there was a picture of a man fishing with this cork handle um, rod which had this, um, I think it was probably a shooting line or something. It had this yellowish, heavy looking line. And at the end of it was a beautiful Iwana. And I had never caught an Iwana then. I had never heard of, uh, I didn't know what it was, but at the bottom of the picture it said, you know, um, Tenkara rig worked quite well or something. And so I knew, I learned that that was called Tenkara. And that was when I was eight. So. And then um, I think right after that, I pulled out some uh, nylon lines I was, I was using for salt water that was yellow, um, cut it to my KD rods by rod length and went up to the mountains. I bought some flies from the store and I tried to cast and I basically caught everything around but, you know, the fish, <laughs> all kinds of rocks and tree branches. And I didn't know how to cast. I didn't know what the mechanism was. Um, so I kept doing that for some time, some time uh, in between my KDU fishing and I tried lure fishing um, also, that was quite fun. But Tenkara was just, I don't know, different because maybe because it was so difficult and I couldn't figure it out. It was like, okay, I need to be able to do this to satisfy myself. So, um, but then at age 12, I decided to go to school in the States. Um, you know, I don't want to talk about this for too long, but I just wanted to, you know, see the world outside, basically. And I told my mom and my dad, hey, you know, if it doesn't work out, I can always just hop on a flight and come back. You know, what's the big deal? And I knew they had money back then because they just sold their, you know, commercial piece of uh, real estate. So I was like, hey, this is a good time to maybe ask him for that. And um, so every summer I'd come back. To Japan, summer vacations are long, you know, two or three months. Um, and I'd fish in the mountains. And eventually, um, and I, then I'd try Tenkara here and there, but I couldn't really figure it out. Um, and I wasn't able to catch a fish. It wasn't until I was in high school I was able to catch my first fish on a kibari. And since then, I've been, well, not necessarily 100%, but in the last 15 years at least, I've been about 100% Tenkara angler. If you have good fundamentals, you should be able to cast with any rod, any line, and, and your fishing sh experience should be fine. You should be able to catch fish. But when you, I, I've become more sp specific about um, casting to the opposite bank, opposite side of the river, um, and manipulating the fly on the surface. And I could sink it, sink the fly, or do something else, maybe catch more fish. But I really like it when the, fish comes to the surface. So, um, so counting backwards from that goal of catching fish on the surface, um, accurate casting. And casting experience to me is important. So that would mean lighter lines. And in order to cast a lighter line, you have to have a full flex, like light, um, soft action rod. So my rod now is 4.5 meter. Uh, it's not a 10 cara rod. Uh, you'd probably recognize the name Rinfu. Um, so I've, they, it's been discontinued, discontinued, but as soon as I heard of the news, I looked everywhere, you know, uh, I think that was after I met you guys. I, I was able to purchase about four, I think. I gave another one away, but I still have three <laughs> rainfoods left. Um, it's 4.5 meter full flex um, uh, rods. 
So my casting line is, I usually use number two or 2.5 level line fluorocarbon, but when there is no wind, um, I would go and try with uh, number three nylon. And you want to look for hardy nylon because they're quite soft. Um, and uh, sometimes you know, crazy friends would um, invite me out when the weather is terrible um, and you really can't cast with a level line. So in those situations, I don't like to fish in that type of a condition. But if I have to, I would use a taper line. Usually a Fujino nylon taper line, uh, like seven, eight meters. I don't really enjoy, it's not that I don't enjoy tying flies, but I don't seem to enjoy it as much as some of the other people. Some people are really into tying. Um, I can rather do without the effort, the time. Um, there is the core group or core, the single type um, of kebari that I like to tie which I think you have seen. And I, uh, and I have, I make them in um, like size 10, 12, um, maybe 14. So I have, that's my like core group of flies that I use. But because I don't like to tie flies so much, I like to go up to people and say, hey, I, you know, what, what's your fly? You know, what's your go-to fly? And uh, can I have one or two? And I like to collect other people's flies and um, use them at the same time. I used to, you know, sit down, I used to enjoy sitting down by my, at my desk, you know, with a can of beer or a glass of wine or something while I'm making my flies, but I don't really, it's kind of, it's become kind of a burden for me nowadays. So, um, yeah, I'll use anything basically, but my target surface, the most important thing, I'd like to use flies targeting the surface of the water because I, I, I enjoy getting the fish to come out to my fly. Early in the season, in March or April, you know, um, I haven't fished in three, four months. Um, and I feel like I need to work on my techniques and skills again, just to polish things up. And I wouldn't really be concerned about size at the time. Just get out and, and see how many fish I can catch. And as the season progresses um, in usually end of May or so, um, we have sakuramasu the cherry yamame, uh, or satsukimasu, which is a mago version of the sea run. Um, and you can get to places where you can fish for them. I have friends that specially, uh, specialize in targeting those fish too. So I would go see them and see if I can catch one myself. And, um, and that's um, quite difficult to do. You know, you might catch one in a season or two, maybe three, you know. And that's fun to do too. And as the season progresses later to summer and fall, um, you know, I've caught enough fish in the season now. So I would maybe focus more on the size and the quality, um, the aesthetics of the fish too, not just length of the fish. Oh, I've got a big fish, but also thickness, the firmness, the, the muscle, you know, the muscular fish, uh, fish that have, you know, their uh, heads turn into curve, you know, approaching the spawning season. It's found the male Yamame or Iwana. Um, you know, they're great to, to have uh, at the end of their fly, you know. So, yeah, I think my theme changes from season to season. You know, because I played lacrosse for, it was my passion as, besides, you know, fishing for many years. I started playing when I was 12 and I played with uh, under 19 Japanese national team, not to brag, but I used to be fit, okay? <laughs> this is my, uh, this is 20 years ago. But um, uh, the most important thing in lacrosse was the fundamentals, right? And a lot of the kids, they try to do fancy things like behind the back passes and, you know, be between the legs throws. And uh, if you kept on working those fancy things too much, then in the game, you would only use those skills maybe 1% of the time. 99% of the time, you have to rely on good fundamental techniques. And, um, and I think the Japanese um, tankara anglers, many of them have that. So I think if people um, took their time, instead of rushing to the end results, just work on the good fundamentals, practice, and be patient with the progress. And then eventually, I think, you know, they would become great anglers themselves. I, I really appreciate history in many ways, not just history of Tenkara. Um, and also, I know we talked about how these villages, 
and in the mountains are disappearing. The culture, the people, they're the they're aging. Um, there is no economy in the mountains, and they, they can't really make a living from hunting bears and fishing for iguanas anymore. So young people, they have to come down to towns and cities to, you know, um, create a future for themselves. And um, and it's it's a shame that it has to be that way. And Tenkara, I especially like it, I think, because it has this, you know, very difficult lifestyle that people carried on for centuries behind um, just fishing. So in the process of learning how to fish with Tenkara, I really enjoy studying the history and meeting people who can tell us or me about, um, you know, the past. And it seems that people outside Japan are keen on that also. Um, and I really appreciate that. That was a long time coming. Go in his own words, for, <laughs> for the first time on Tenkara in Focus. Um, thanks, Go. Massive thanks to you. You know how appreciative we are of all the work that you do and continue to do. Mm. Um, there's not much more you can say about that. So in rounding up, uh, first up, we'll put some links on screen. If you want to check out those Karasu rods we mentioned earlier, you can head over to discovertinkara.com or follow the links that will be on screen now. Um, what else can we uh, leave people with? Well, the other thing is, is, of course, that because these episodes are going to come out thick and fast from now on, uh, it's very easy to uh, overlook them. Mm. So the best way to avoid missing anything is to click on the button to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And that way yeah. you'll get a little notification every time we put out something new. And you can check out and see if it's something that uh, really floats your boat. Yeah, there are loads of benefits to that subscribe button. If, you, if you've not used it before, when you watch these videos, it'll remember where you watched it too. So you can come back and pick up from the same point later yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's a really useful little feature just to help you get the most out of these programs too. Uh, on top of that, maybe worth signing up to our email tutorials if you've not done that already. Yes, I mean the thing for me is obviously Go is an elite angler. Uh, we've learned a huge amount from him, but we've broken down into sort of stepwise, um, you know, a step-by-step -step building blocks approach to actually getting you to be able to reliably catch fish on stream using a variety of methods, but also building up to that high-level Tenkara stuff. It's completely free. There's more than a year's worth of lessons on there. All you need to do is click on the little link that's on screen now, or we'll put another link in the description. Check them out, start using the techniques, and if the lessons aren't working for you, just simply click unsubscribe from within any of the individual lessons themselves. So I think it's that about wraps that. it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> it from us on another episode of Ten Carry and Focus. We'll be back next week with more, but until then, thanks from us. Goodbye. <laughs>